I'm going to go in the middle, too. Oh, you, oh, you <laughs> won't go in the middle. Here, move my stuff up. No, no, you're fine. change eyes. But anyway, <laughs> my eye hurt, so I couldn't read. And then I turned on the TV and I said, well, I'll watch a Western. Uh, but the Westerns weren't any good, so I, I didn't watch that. And so I just went to channel surfing. I said, let me find a preacher I agree with. <laughs> and I'll listen to him. I can shut my eyes and just listen to the message. As it turned out, I didn't find a preacher either. But uh, I did find Kurt Cameron. And uh, uh, I know you're probably familiar with him in the past, and but anyway, he uh, he had a fellow on his program, um, and I think it's called Afterthought. Does that sound right? It's something afterward, anyway. And uh, what they what they do, they talk, and then when they're finished at the end of it, Kurt gives a summary of what they discussed and how it applies to us. Anyway, the fellow that he had with him that day, one was a military man that has since it was Veterans Day. Uh, is that right? Memorial Day. Memorial Day. And uh, the soldier uh, has a number of ministries for veterans because veterans have a hard time getting back into society because when they're in the service, it's like a family. They're close, but when they come home, it seems like they're separated. So he has a ministry going where that uh, they 
entertain them or bring them together where that they don't feel alone. And, uh, and I think that's good. Well, there's a lot of other things they do as well. Uh, but then the other person that was on the program uh, was Dave, um, let me think of his name, Barton. He's the president uh, of uh, Wall Builders. And I have followed him for years. I like Dave. Uh, he's got some number, well, he's a history fellow. And uh, he has some good books. And he has one now, it's talking about America, the beginning of America. And one of the things he shared, and I just want to put that in, that during the time of uh, the, before the revolution, they were talking about all the men that signed that document uh, for our independence and how that each one of them gave their life and all their possessions or most of their possessions because they did that and how that the British was after them. And so David has uh, recorded a lot of this and put it in a book. But one thing that I was interested in was that uh, he talked about one of my favorite preachers. And by the way, he wasn't Baptist, he was Methodist. But um, anyway, David said that if, if the colonies had continued as they were, that uh, we would have never beat the British. But what happened is that George Whitfield, and it's really spelled Whitefield, but it's Whitfield, George uh, Whitfield was preaching and uh, he traveled through the colonies and he chose for his text in the book of Acts chapter 10 were that Peter went to the house of Cornelius and how that he said, Peter saying, God is no respecter of persons, how that he wanted us to be together. And so be, because of this, it brought the colonies together. Now I thought, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a good student of history, and every, every week I realized that I should go back and study some of it. But, you know, I was hard-headed when I was in school. I said, you hear that I was. <laughs> anyway, but what he said was, that, and this is interesting, that when the pilgrims came over here and they set up their colonies, they really kind of did like Europe. When you went from one colony, say you were up in Pennsylvania, and you won't go down to the Carolinas or someplace, that uh, you had to stop at the border and you had to register, and then you had to change your money because each colony had their own money. And so you had to exchange it, you know. Uh, and so uh, that was a problem. But the other thing was that uh, if you were of us, and most of them were different religions that was set up in different colonies, there was the Lutheran, the Presbyterian, the Episcopal, and by the way, there was a few Baptists out there, and, uh, and Methodists. Well, anyway, what they would do is that if you happen to be over in their territory and they caught you talking to people, uh, they lock you up. They don't want you over proselyting. And so they, we were really divided. But when uh, George was preaching, he was preaching unity. And what they did is they came together because of the preaching of God's Word. Now why do I say all this? Because folks, God had a hand in the uh, organization and the development of our country. Amen. And we talk about how our Constitution was set up uh, based on God's Word. When you go through all that, I just don't understand these people today that says, we don't need God. Did that? Well, that was a long way to get to that phrase, wasn't it? <laughs> but I want you to think about that, that we need to stop people putting down God in our country. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, what happened uh, with Judah and Israel. Uh, and so let me, let's, before we get into the lesson, remember that, that Judah is down here. <coughs> remember after Solomon, that his son Rehoboam uh, decided that he was going to make uh, the life of the Israelites miserable and uh, more than Solomon did. And so uh, Jeroboam was chosen as king of, actually it was Israel, but it's called Samaria, they call that. And their capital was in some, at the Samaritan city. And so Judah, their capital would be Jerusalem. This would be the lineage of David that God set up to be the rulers of that land. By the way, Jesus fits this lineage, not that lineage. Does that make sense? And it's good to know that. Because 
This, this goes into our lesson today in the book of Jeremiah. Now, I, what I find real interesting is that uh, last week I told you that the first chapter was like a prologue for the whole book of Jeremiah. What I didn't tell you was that it's not the only one. Actually, the first six chapters is the prologue to the book of Jeremiah. Everything that he talks about in these six chapters, later on through the book, he's going to spell out in more detail of what's happening. And so, does that make any sense to you as we go into Jeremiah? Because most people, and I found this out, I was looking for some commentaries on Jeremiah, and there's not much out there. I guess our writers don't want to deal with this stuff. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Jeremiah is going to talk about a lot of suffering. And he's telling Israel because they've sinned and Judah. He specifically was to Judah. Let me put it this way. Jeremiah prophesied in Jerusalem most of the time. And that would be down here in Jerusalem. And if you're looking at this map, it would be right up at Bethlehem. So Jerusalem <laughs> better be here. Okay, so it would be Jerusalem where Jeremiah would spend most of his uh, prophetic ministry. Now, what's interesting, during his time, the, the uh, captives was taken to Babylon, and that's what he's talking about. They're going to be judged because of their sin. They didn't obey God. Why do I major on that? Because I believe today that this country that God set up for us mm -hmm. and here for us to live in, and God's going to have to judge us because of the same things that happened to Judah uh, and the way they were living is what's happening today in America. And so God's going to have to judge us for that. So judgment's coming to America. And we don't like to say that because, you know, we all have family, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And folks, I don't know what they're going to be going through. Now, I could tell you that we could pray the Lord come back <laughs> but if the families are not saved, then they still going to go through the tribulation. Now that is if you believe like I do that there's going to be a rapture and in the tribulation. But anyway, Amen. Uh, and if you don't believe that, well, I hope you get it straight. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, and, and there's some that believe that we're in the millennium right now. And so. Uh, if, if Satan has been bound, yeah. whoo, what's it going to be like when he's let loose? Mighty long chain. I think it reaches all the way to Washington, D.C. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, these are things I want you to think about as we go into our study. And so our writers have just given us chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, and we'll cover that. But in reality, when I sent the notice out, I asked you to uh, make comment or got questions, and I was thinking about the whole six chapters. Well, start with two, maybe, and go through six. And I just wondered if anybody did that. Well, you get a zero for homework. Right. Right? <laughs> uh, no, seriously, I know some of you probably, I know you read it. So did you come up with any questions or comments, you know? Poor leadership, we'll have poor followers. Okay, if we have poor leadership, we'll have poor followers. Right, right. And, and this, like our country is today, we have we don't have leadership, so we've got everything else is falling apart. Okay. And back then, you know, put in a new king or something like that, so well, this thing happened. The other, that other king's <coughs> family got annihilated. Yes. We need to, do we need to clean wash it down? Mm -hmm. I didn't say it now, I let him, I said clean them out. Okay. <laughs> Very good though. You no, know I mean, but see we've got a we've got a harness messed up there and nobody can get it straightened out. So. Oh, what are we talking about? Washington? Washington. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Could you hear what he said back there? <coughs> all right. So and did you kind of agree with that? Mm -hmm. That it seems like that it really speaking to us today, isn't it? Yeah. And sometimes when we read the scripture, it don't seem like it applies. But I think this Jeremiah applies to us in America, and and so therefore we as God's people have to do something about it. 
And God's leading us to do something about it. There's men that's been raised up now that are speaking up and standing up. And, 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 and we may not hear about them, but it may be the small churches out there somewhere that uh, the pastors are really preaching the truth and they're, they're encouraging their members in the Lord. And so we want to do that as well. We, not, and not only us, but our families and our friends to encourage them. And you know something else? There, there is a, uh, there's a need out in the world, in America here, for people to understand Revelation. Because they're looking at what's happening in the world today, and they're saying, what's going on? And you know what? That's a door to be open. I mean, it's open for you to witness. And when they say, what's going on? Say, hey, I know what's going on. God's going to judge us. Oh, wait a minute. Boy, now you got to really show up. <laughs> and, and then you, you talk about all the judgment that's coming. And so, uh, we, it, get, it does give us an opportunity. I was at a meeting, I think I told you this before, a few weeks ago. And all the writers that was there, they had books. And every one of them had sold out of their commentaries or their writings on the book of Revelation. And I'm talking about a, a Baptist group that was together and the people are wanting answers. And you may tell you something else. There's not many pastors, and I, I, don't, I don't know how to qualify that, that's really preaching about judgment of God. We want to preach love. And that's true, right? God loves us. And we're so thankful for that. But, uh, but there's judgments coming, and we don't want to talk about it, but we should. Okay, if now, did anybody else got something to say? If you love your kids, there's judgment coming. If you love, oh, yes. My father used to love to judge me, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? When he used that belt, it just wrapped all the way around. <laughs> okay. I, think, I, I really think that I could have reported him to the police. You'd have to use a bigger belt today. Oh! <laughs> I hope you didn't hear that back then. We did. We did. A bigger belt. Wow. Yeah, right. Oh, we get all the way around. <laughs> well, my my cousins, they got the razor strap. You know what that is? Oh, yeah. The, the razor strap? Yeah, that was, that's what my uncle used to whip them with. I mean, hey, I folk believe in whipping, you know. You act up, we straighten you out. But that's anyway. So how about that? Anybody else got something that you that you been, okay, John? The, uh, <clears throat> the devil's already taken over the educational system in this country. And we're even starting down, or they are starting down in kindergarten, indoctrinating these kids. And uh, if we don't get that turned around, these kids are going to raise they're not going to know any different. <coughs> All they're going to know is, is everything with biblical. Yes. And what was it? Uh, I think was it. Um, well, Reba, I think last week said that they wanted to get rid of the King James Bible. Yeah, but I, I do know that they want to get them out of the school libraries. Yeah. And a, a lot of school districts have mm -hmm. taken the Bibles out of the mm -hmm. libraries. Now I'm going to ask you a hard question. How many of you read the Bible out of a library when he was in school? Right. How many of you ever saw somebody read? Yeah, I didn't have to. Everybody in town went to Bible school. Probably in Elmer, you went to all three churches. Oh, you went to all three churches? Yeah, there were three churches, and you went to all three Bible schools. Well, I'd be confused, but anyway. Well, that's, I think that's probably true. So in different areas, yes. Okay. But the Bible was taught at home, so why would the kids go to school to find a Bible to read? Because they had a Bible at home. Right. Right. Okay. And they were, you know, read from and taught from. Okay. <coughs> Families today don't even hardly want to get together for a meal or talk or anything. That's true. That's a good thought, isn't it? How many of you had Bible reading in your home? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm just thinking about it. But I remember that we didn't have that in my home because my dad wasn't a believer. But um, till later, much later, later in life, I was grown then. But um, I, I've been in homes where that every night 
when they'd have dinner, then after dinner they just sit and read the scripture. And the father did it. And yes, ma'am. I had an occasion this week to find out about a lady um, in this town, uh, a grown woman with grown children and grandchildren, I think. If I were to call her name, a lot of you would know who that is. She did not own a Bible. She didn't own a Bible. She did not own a Bible. She had a children's Bible story book that she was reading out of. She's fairly recently become in, become interested in really learning about the walk of faith. So all she knew was the children's books? The books? children's, uh-huh, the children's okay. Bible. Well, at least she had that. Though. Well, I mean, a storybook. It was a children's storybook. Oh, so. okay. And so now she's interested in the Bible. Now, now she has a Bible. Fantastic. And excited. But, okay. you know, it just blew my mind to think that someone, you know, in this town uh, held a job, respectable person, um, didn't have a Bible. I was shocked when Laura and Michelle was talking about what's in our schools here. And when mm -hmm. um, the things that, well, Laura talked about the Bibles they brought to school. And it wasn't what we would consider the Bible a lot of. Well, that's interesting. So, and you know, I live in Chicago area, so uh, I'm used to the mean side of life. And I came to Macon and I thought, boy, this, this is the next step to heaven. <laughs> but I come to find out the devil's here. And he's busy. And you're right, John, the, the devil's starting with our children now. And I'm just reading this week how that, that what they're teaching uh, these young children, kindergarten and first and second graders, that they tell them about what gender is, and these little children say, well, I don't know if I'm a girl or a boy. But they're planting the seeds in these children, and that's horrible. And so the devil is really after our children. He's after, well, he hates the Lord, so he hates you and me, and he hates the church that preaches the truth. And so he's fighting us. And he hates children. And he hates oh, yes. because they're innocent. They are innocent, you know? yes. And they haven't been um, defiled by the world, and so he hates them. It's obvious. It is very obvious, yes, ma'am. And that's what's happening, isn't it? Uh, and and we're seeing that. But it's not just not them. How about the teenagers? You know, they they want to change their gender and all this type of stuff. But you know what? That's just against God. God formed us, made us, gave us life. And then so what we're saying when we change that, we're saying, God, I don't like what you did. I want to be in charge. Is that right? Mm -hmm. They're also te teaching that the Bible is a book of fiction. Yes, they say the Bible is just a book of fiction. Yeah. They don't, uh, that's even worse than the junior thing as far as I'm concerned. Okay. And they did say that there, it's been banned and they're saying that this, this Bible has all this pornography and stuff in it. Vulgarity and violence. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, they're and, worried about that in the Bible? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, so here's what they're doing. But, but, they, but the, 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 the devil's working and what he's trying to do, he's destroying America. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we need to be much in prayer for our leaders. Yes, ma'am. And I think we have to really be concerned about the colleges that we're sending our grandkids to because the teachers are being taught this in college and then coming back and teaching school kids. So I think that's where it starts. Yes. And, and I, I'm thinking too on that, and I don't, I, I'm we all way off our lesson. Not we're not away from our lesson. We're talking about what's happening today in comparing here. So, yes. So we really need to be praying for our pastors and for God's people and for our country and our leaders and what they say in the scripture that we should pray for them, right? And we should pray for one another because I don't know what you're being challenged with and you probably don't know what I'm being challenged with, but we're all being challenged by the devil one way or another because he'd like to shut us up. In fact, he'd kind of like to kill us. But he got to get over God to do that. Isn't that great? 
<laughs> oh, he did. Lord God, the Lord just protects us. <laughs> well, okay, let's do this. Let's read some scripture. Chapter 2 of uh, Jeremiah, verse 1, 2, and 3. Somebody read those three verses. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Well, you know, what? I, when I read this, I said, what the world is the Lord doing? Is he protecting his people? Because I remember Israel was a pain in the neck. <laughs> you know? And, and they, they didn't want to obey the Lord out there in the desert, remember? You know, and, and, and God was killing thousands at a time because they disobeyed him. But here's what God is saying, that he loved them. And that's what I like about it. He loved them even though they were disobedient. They did listen to him. And remember on Mount Sinai, when he gave the law to him, they said, we will obey the law. Mm -hmm. We will obey the Lord. And so this is kind of what he's saying. This was the honeymoon, if so to speak, of the marriage. My, by the way, do you know in, uh, in Jeremiah, God's going to say that he was married to Israel and he divorced her. That's interesting, isn't it? But I guess from that he didn't di divorce Judah. That gets in a whole new study. I just thought I'd kick it up. Okay, but here, notice what it is though. It says that God, this is God's word. This is not Jeremiah. This is not the king. Uh, at this time, the king was Josiah. And so this is the be pretty much the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry. Because uh, when he began to prophesy, Josiah was king of Judah. And, uh, and he was trying to change. Remember when Josiah became king, he was only eight years old. <laughs> so the person that had the influence in his life was the high priest. And the high priest was a man that loved the Lord at that time. And so he was training Josiah how God would. Now, Josiah, when he came on, his father was a very wicked man. And his grandfather was a wicked man until God changed him. And that was Manasseh. Manasseh was, a, uh, was the son of oh, Hezekiah. And so Hezekiah was a godly man. And then Manasseh came along and man, he was the exact opposite. He set up all these pagan places. And then he had a son. Uh, but at the end of Manasseh, though, he came back to the Lord. At least that happened. But his son didn't. And then along came Josiah. And this man started out at the very beginning wanting to do it. I think when he was 16 years old, he made the decision to serve the Lord. And God came into his life. And, and you read some of this in, the, in Chronicles, the last three chapters, and 2 Kings, the last three chapters. And you'll read about these last kings of Judah. And uh, Josiah, though, he, he really brought a revival to Judah. And a, a, a number of the people that was up in Israel part, they actually came down and celebrated down here in Jerusalem because Samaria or Israel had been taken captive over to, and we can't get it on this map and we can't get it on that map. So anyway, they're over in what we would call um, Babylonian area, which was, they actually ended up in Nineveh and then further south down the valley of the, the um, Euphrates and the Tigris River. So down through that area is where they were carried. But there was people that were left in the land. And so when Josiah finally had this big Passover, and in fact, there was never one like it. I mean, they, they slaughtered so many animals to worship God. And he led the people in that, and they had a great time. But here's the thing that I learned about Josiah. Josiah Brought, uh, God brought a revival through Josiah and his teaching and his leadership. And I'm going to tell you, he destroyed a lot of idols and, and uh, those groves and all that. But here's the part I got. The people didn't get it. That's a sad part, isn't it? The, and and this, Jeremiah's going to tell you this later. But after all of that, that Josiah did, and the people said they were with him and all that. But the fact is, they didn't really accept it wholeheartedly. Yeah, that's okay for now. 
How many times have you ever seen where a church has a revival and they seem to have a good, good movement of the Lord and the Spirit in it and then two or three weeks later you can't even see you came to town? <coughs> know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we're, we, we let our emotion drive us but it doesn't move our hearts. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So now, anybody else want to say something on this? I know how God is saying how He loved them and how that relationship was there. And that, uh, and then he moves on to uh, about the holiness that they had for the Lord. And at one time that was true as well. But notice at the very end of verse 3, well, it starts out that thus saith the Lord in verse 2, and down at the end of it it says, says the Lord. I want you to, as you go through the book of Jeremiah, look how often Jeremiah puts down, this is what God said. God said it. This is not me. This is God saying it. Now, when you read Paul a lot of times, Paul writes that out, but, but it's still God's Word, right? And we don't want to take away from that. This is God's Word. We believe in the verbal, inspiration, infallible Word of God, right? Right. Oh, look at all them words. I didn't know I knew them. But anyway. <laughs> and so, this is how important the Word of God is. But now today, in America... We're doing away with God's Word because it's all fiction. It doesn't mean anything. But then they also, not only doing that, they're saying, who is God that we should listen to Him, right? But that's what Judah did also. Who is God that we should listen to Him? Well, I'm thinking as I get into this part, it's a little bit like in the book of Judges. They all did what was right in their own eyes. When I think of the schools believe that the Bible is fiction, they would get rid of the whole library. Because what percentage of the library is fiction books? Well, that's true. Yeah. So they, they obviously don't truly believe it's fiction. Okay. That's just their excuse. They just say that, right? But God, had, I mean, excuse me, Satan has questioned God from the book back in Genesis, right? <laughs> Yea, hath God not said? So questioning that. And so we're still doing it today. The problem that I'm having is, in my mind, is how do we counteract this <coughs> by our words and by our actions. Okay. Uh, if I'm going to get through this, I better go to the next section then. Okay, 4 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become a dollar? Okay. Neither did they say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and pits, through the lands of drought and the shadow of death, through the land that no one crossed and where no one dwelt? I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, Where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wow. Okay, let's go back and let's follow Israel. Remember they came from Egypt. God delivered. Egypt is a picture of sin. And so God delivered them out of sin to go to the promised land. And when it's gone, you know how they got to the promised land. And they sent the spies out and they came back. And ten said, we can't do it. And two said, let's go take them right now. And, and aren't you glad those two got in? <laughs> the others didn't. Anyway, and so, uh, and, and what I like is that when you look at Joshua and, and Caleb, and after, Caleb is an old man now. And then when he got ready, he said, I want that mountain over there. And Joshua said, go get it. And he did. And he was still in the power that he had 40 years earlier. Isn't that amazing? God blesses us sometimes when he, we don't even see it. Anyway, think about that. Well, anyway, so now they, they go in and take the land and it's already, the vegetation is there, the, the vines are there with the grapes and whatever else that grows on them. And, and the houses are already built. In other words, God took them and put them into a land that was prepared for them. They didn't have to do anything. And that's what he's talking about. That he gave them this. It was a gift to them. And you know what? They didn't appreciate it. And I'm going to tell you something. 
God give us a gift of salvation and there's a lot of people that don't appreciate it because they're not living for the Lord. If, am I being too hard? <laughs> okay. So then I, I looked down here and, and in my Bible when I got down to where she was using the, the idolaters there, my, I have the word worthless. Other words, it was empty. What they have done, they've gone after something that's not real. And uh, that's what uh, the idols did. And, uh, and then they, boy, he really gets to, down on it now when he, he says, and did, neither did they say, where's the Lord? But back in the wilderness out there, they say, we'll follow you. But now, they don't want the Lord. And here's the why. Here's why. This is why it's a picture of America. They got everything they could need. We're wealthy in America. <coughs> and so therefore, what do we need God for? What do we need heaven for? Does it sound like I'm kind of preaching? <laughs> when they need it, they'll find it. Pardon me? When they need it, then they'll find it or they'll look for it. Okay, when they need it. Yeah. And, and that's a good thing, though. So, that's why judgment. God is going to judge where we'll see we need Him. I believe there will be a lot of people saved during tribulation, but they're going to die during it. So, that's, that's another thing. All right. And so then, uh, He said, who, who led them through the wilderness. And actually, what He's saying is, when I brought you from Egypt over here, and brought you out through the wilderness. He said, people don't live out there. So we didn't come by way where people are living. We came through a desert place where nobody was living. But I took care of you anyway. In other words, there wasn't uh, all that vegetation out there. But God gave them water. And He gave them manna every day. Oh my goodness. How about that, ladies? You have to learn all these different ways to cook manna. <laughs> uh, sometimes I think Pam is practicing with eggs like that. I get eggs all different shapes and colors and all fixed up. And she puts all that stuff with them. And, and, and so I think she was thinking about manna. But anyway. <laughs> and, and you know what's interesting about that? God told them to go out and gather, you know, at, uh, before the Sabbath. And, and on the Sabbath, don't go out. And some went out anyway, and the worms eat it up. But what am I saying that for? I'm saying it's better to obey the Lord than do it on your own. Well, anyway, this is, this is what happened. And they're on the way to the promised land, and, and they got there. Well, God fed them out in the wilderness there. And you know, one time He even brought some meat in, right? They came in. And they went out and it was up about knee high and they just took all these birds and, and, and then they got it and they just gorged themselves. And God got a little bit upset. Because they didn't appreciate it. I'm going to ask you again, do you appreciate the Lord today? He's been good to us, hasn't He? <coughs> the other night I was thinking about, and, and I've been over to the Middle East and, and I've seen that land over there. And, and I have to tell you, I, I thought about people that born down in Africa or down South America or just in Mexico or somewhere. In fact, I don't even want to be born in Canada. I like America. But I'm just thankful I was born here. Because God could have brought me in somewhere else, right? But He didn't. And so we need to thank the Lord that we're born here in America and the freedom we have. Okay, and then it he, he goes on to talk about it's a desert place. It's got pits. And the Lord just led them. Remember, how did He guide them through the desert? You remember that? A cloud. A cloud? A, cloud, a fire. A fire and then night. a fire at night. Here's what I want to get you. They didn't follow the Lord. He led them. Isn't that beautiful? They, and they didn't move whenever He stayed in the spot. They waited till He moved and then they moved. Isn't that great? And does that apply to us? Shouldn't we follow the Lord? It, it doesn't mean that He just goes with them. He led them. Okay. And so then let's see what else. And the, uh, Then there's a land that uh, no one crosses. That's what He's talking about, that desert out there. And then they're going to end up next to the Red Sea. And then He said, I brought you into a bountiful country to eat of its fruit and its goodness. 
In other words, it's right there. All you got to do is go harvest it and eat it. It's a good thing they didn't have deep freeze back then. They could have, they froze up a bunch of stuff. <laughs> and, and, and you know, I hate to say this, but if, if they're like we are, uh, we just keep buying more freezers. So I don't know how much we're going to eat one of these days, but we do it. All right. And, and then I want you to see the last, the last verse. And, and here he said, the priest did not say, where is the Lord? Now, what's he talking about? He's saying their spiritual leaders right. wasn't following the Lord, right? right. Mm -hmm. So it's important. We talked about the, the political leaders. Now we're talking about the spiritual leaders. They need to follow the Lord. And if they don't, they encourage us not to follow the Lord too, right? I mean, hey, we don't like to be the only one out there. But isn't that what God called us to do if we're the only one? I haven't got to that, and, but I'm going to tell you this. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 5, I think it is, or is it chapter 3? Let me see. No, that was where he's going to divorce him. I think it's chapter 5. But anyway, he's going to say, he's going to send Jeremiah to Jerusalem, and he said, go find at least one person. Get this. Does that remind you of something? How about Abraham? Abraham was saying to God, and he got it down, if I can find ten righteous people, would you spare the city? When God sent Jeremiah into Jerusalem, Jeremiah couldn't find one righteous person. Look how far they've gotten away from God. And they're God-chosen people. They're God's special. It's a, the pride of his, li his life. His pride of his eye. Is that what it is? The apple of his eye. How say it again? The apple of his eye. Apple of his eye. I made a pair out of it. I mean, okay. An apple of his eye. So this is Israel. And what is the church today? The bride of Christ. And I don't want to get too much prophecy there. Someone just stop right there. <laughs> Let's read in 9 through 13. Therefore, I will... Oh, well, excuse me. I've got some... Can I come back to you, huh? I've got uh, verse 8 started to highlight it. That whole verse is America today. This whole verse, chapter, uh, verse 8, mm -hmm. I think you're probably right. <laughs> Those that handle the law don't know me. And then the rulers transgress, transgress against me. The prophets prophesy by Baal. And they walk after things that do not prophesy. I think you're right, John. I should have said that, but you did it, so I don't have to. All right, good deal. Okay, now, Michelle. Therefore, I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your sons' sons I will contend. For cross to the coastlands of Kittim and see, and send to Kedar and observe closely, and see if there has been such a thing as this. Has a nation changed gods when they were not gods? For my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. And shudder, be very desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. All right. Now, let, let, I'm going to try to get through this pretty fast because we talked about all the other stuff at the beginning. But, but here, good, beautiful, this is really beautiful, though, that therefore I will bring charges against you, says the Lord. So, I want you to see this. If you sin, you'll get charged. Does that make any sense? And, and that's why God was doing it. It wasn't the priest because the priests were following Baal. Whatever they learned there, that's what they were giving the people. And listen, and you know, it also teaches that they become like their God. So if you have a, a stone God, does that mean you become like a stone? Or they carved them out of the wood like a tree, which the Scripture teaches that that's no God. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have eyes, they can't see. They don't have a heart. And so they can't go into Aphel. <laughs> Anyway, so, okay, and then what he basically said here, he talks about Cyprus, and then he talks about 
uh, another place. And what he's really doing is he's going from the Cyprus over here all the way over to the Bedouins that the Arab Bedouin.